Okay, before we start, let's address the elephant in the room. I look like this because I had a tooth operation this week. Get the laughter out of your system. Personally, I think it's wonderful that I could get this sorted out in half an hour on a weekday morning, whereas 200 years ago, I probably would have died of an infection. This over here is a thermocouple. Thermocouples are a seriously common way of measuring process temperatures, and I'm going to show you how they work. A thermocouple is simply two wires of dissimilar metals that are connected together at both ends. The specific thermocouple is a K-type thermocouple. Right, and now here I've got another thermocouple, just like this one over here, I bought them at the same time, connected to the gadget that's going to read out the temperature. As you can see, the temperature in the room is about 23, 24 degrees. Next to it is an unrelated piece of hardware that may give you flashbacks to high school physics and circuits. It's just a plain voltmeter measuring direct current voltage in millivolts. Here I've got my fridge, my freezer, and conveniently for this video right next to it, my oven. Now we're going to go coldest to hottest. We're going to start by putting the thermocouple into my freezer. Let's wait for the temperature to stabilize. Right, I think we're kind of there. My freezer is sitting at about minus 28 degrees Celsius. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to unplug the thermocouple. So now I've just got a loose set of wires running to my freezer. What I'm going to do now is show you what the voltage across these two terminals are. This wasn't in millivolts. Right, so I've got a potential difference across this thermocouple of two millivolts. Now that two millivolts is there currently, regardless of whether I measure it or not. I know this is tough for you chemical engineers to understand. The reason I have a potential difference is because when two dissimilar metals are connected electrically and there is a temperature difference between the two connections, it generates a voltage. It's called the Seebeck effect and that is the principle which is used in converting voltages into temperatures. Right, we're still at minus 30 degrees. Let's go into my fridge. Again, we'll wait for the temperature to stabilize. I just realized now that the freezer was actually minus two millivolts, not two millivolts, not positive. So that's important. Temperature in my fridge is stabilized. We're gonna do the same thing. It's about three, four degrees. And the voltage is minus one millivolt, as opposed to minus two millivolts. Not very exciting. You may be excused in thinking this is a little bit dumb. So let's move from low temperatures and go to high temperatures. That is why I have my oven on. It's set at 150 degrees on the knob. Let's see how much it really is. I'd say we're about finished, right? Actually, I'm pretty impressed at how well calibrated the knob is. I wasn't expecting to get within a couple of degrees. So 152 at a setting of eyeballed 150. Right, now as you can see, we've moved from a negative voltage up to a positive voltage of about five millivolts. Now what we're going to do is we're going to crank up the oven from 150. Let's crank it up to 200 and see what happens. This may take a while, so I may need another beer. Let's leave it at that, I think, right? Let's say it's about 194 degrees. I'll plug it in again afterwards. Let's check the voltage. There we are, seven millivolts. 
Promise. You believe me, right? Seven. Now, the thing you need to understand is that this voltage exists still here, regardless of all of this stuff. There is a voltage because there's a difference in temperature between that end of the couple that's touching and this end of the couple that's touching. This is typically called the cold junction. The bigger the difference in temperature of the two ends, the greater the potential difference between the two terminals. Let's go plot the values. I can't plot the voltages against the temperatures that I measured because like I said, the voltage is generated due to the difference in temperatures between the two ends. So I need to subtract the ambient temperature from these values to get the temperature difference. Plotting the voltages as a function of these temperature differences gives us this. And you probably won't be surprised to hear that there are standard tables that give what these values should be. It is called the International Temperature Scale of 1990, or simply ITS-90, and these tables are available for a variety of thermocouple types. You'd select the thermocouple type based on the range of temperatures you're going to measure. The tables are available from the NIST, and here are the voltages for a K-type thermocouple, which is typically used to measure anywhere between minus 270 and 1370 degrees Celsius. Here are our measured points against the standard values. Not bad, huh? Now, you may ask, hold on, but surely that means this end is whatever the temperature is in the room. And surely that affects the potential difference. And if you've asked that, that's the correct question. If we were measuring a process temperature in a Saudi summer versus if we were measuring a, uh, a process temperature in Siberian winter, the potential differences would be different. And that is why it's important that we know it's 20, 22 in this room currently. You need to do what is called cold junction compensation by knowing what the cold junction temperature actually is. That is why I need the ambient temperature of 23 degrees that I measured at the start. Now this may seem a little bit like cheating, but you can't get around it. In processes, this is typically measured with another non-thermocouple device. The plot I have here has a reference of zero degrees Celsius. That way, the temperature differences are the actual temperatures. The way we compensate our readings for the fact that it was 23 degrees when I measured the voltages is I add the voltage corresponding to 23 degrees to our readings. So I have to add 0.919 millivolts to our readings. This does make our values look worse relative to the standard, but hey, I have a janky multimeter from a hardware store that can't measure microvolts. What can you do?